But I do want to go through with you the letter of the Ramban. And Nachmanides wrote a letter, a very short letter, to his son before uh, he went to Israel. He went to Israel because he was expelled from Spain, and we'll tell you why. And uh, also because it was his dream. That was really the reason why he went to Israel, and it's a big deal for him. And only a few years after he arrived in Israel, uh, he built the famous Bet Knesset Haramban. He wrote a special letter back to his family. Uh, the synagogue of Ramban is in the old city, and it's a beautiful, beautiful synagogue. And if you go in there, in huge, it's one of the most beautiful synagogues in Israel. Um, they build it with a beautiful dome. The audio in the room is also amazing, and it's a very Spanish looking uh, synagogue because he was from Spain. And if you go in there, as soon as you come in, you'll see a huge sign of the Igeret Haramban, the letter that Nachmanides wrote to uh, his son. He had uh, a few sons and they stayed in Spain and he left to go to Israel. That was his dream and he passed there. Um, so I have the letter. I'm not going to go through the whole letter with you. It's, very, it's not that long. It's very short. It's in Hebrew and in English here. And I'm going to go through some of his letter because at the end of this letter, listen to what he says. And I'll tell you a bit about his life. He says to his son, read this letter at least once a week and not less. Do it and fulfill it. Walk with it forever in the ways of Hashem. Go in the way of Hashem so you will succeed in all your ways. And he says, any day that you read this letter, whenever you read it that day, God will answer whatever rises in your heart to request forever. So we're talking about a rabbi from the 13th century. Uh, he, he lived during the time of Maimonides, just a little bit after Maimonides. And um, I fact, have some, yes. Fun fact, oh. uh, me and my older brother, I used to take this letter everywhere I go. I fly with it. Yes, it's a yeah. very important, people like fly in his... Like in Israel, it's a very, it's in the Sidur, it's in the Tehillim, it's added in many prayer books. It's, it's really amazing. So we're going to study it. It's a really beautiful letter and we're going to go through it. Just a little bit about him. Before he fled to Israel, he was summoned for the great debate of uh, Pablo Christianity, Cristiano, not Christianity. He wrote a, actually, because of this great debate that he had, it was in public. He was summoned by the king, the king of Aragon to have this debate. He lived in, uh, we're talking about 1194 till 12, 1270. So in, in the 13th century. At 1267, three years before he went to Israel, uh, he, he was called in for this big debate. And he had the big debate, and it was in front of all the leaders of uh, the, the Christian world and the Crusades or whatever. And he was in front of the king. And he had this debate, and he didn't want to go to the debate. He said, whatever I do, you're going to hurt me for it and my people. He knew that it's a big uh, danger. And whatever he says, if he wins the debate, they're going to hate him and kill him. And if he loses the debate, they'll say he's a liar and a heretic, so he should also be killed. So he said, I don't want the debate until the king, who liked him very much, said, I promise that I will look after you no matter what. We need to have this debate publicly. And uh, to an extent that after... The debate, Maimonides wrote a book called Sefer Havikuach, the book of the debate that he had. And he was obviously, my Nachmanides, he wrote a commentary on the entire Torah, entire Talmud. If you read any of his commentary, each time you read it, it's like blown away. All of Kabbalah, all of the mysticism of Judaism. We're talking about someone that was beyond. And he's in this debate with some guy called Pablo Cristiano who doesn't know much. And uh, he literally floors him. He, like, he just answers every question. The whole crowd loved Nachmanides. All the Christians said, wow, this is unbelievable. And it was an, a clear win on Nachmanides' side. Um, but obviously the king couldn't express too much joy for Nachmanides, who he loved very much. And he made a deal with him, I'll let you leave the country. Uh, we won't kill you, uh, but we'll let you leave the country. And that will be a good way to solve the whole, the whole debate that we had and the whole issue. So they actually made uh, Nachmanides leave, which he did. He went to Israel, that was his dream. And a few years later, went to Akko and Jerusalem. He went just before Rosh Hashanah, just before the new year. And he arrived, he went to Jerusalem, took with him a small Torah. He writes in his book, he says that this 
uh, place is completely desolate. It's really a destructive, uh, destroyed city, just like the Torah says it would be after the Jews leave. And um, there were still Jews throughout Jewish history. Maimonides says that throughout Jewish history, Jews are always in the land of Israel. And it's true. If you always look at our history, even though we may have been a small number of Jews, but we've always been, whether it's in Sfat, with the Kabbalistic movement in, in the 15th century, and, and going to um, Akko and different ports of Israel. Oh, that's why I've got my... That's why I've got the microphone. And uh, he went all over, all over Israel. So anyway, so um, he achieved a lot in his life. And he built this synagogue in the old city. After he passed, many years later, the Muslims uh, destroyed the synagogue. And, um, but uh, actually, not so long ago, it's probably about 15, 20 years ago, they rebuilt Nachmanides' synagogue. So it's very new. And I remember when they rebuilt it, there was a lot of uh, protests happening in the old city from the Arab uh, quarter, saying, oh, you're, they had a lot of conspiracy about Nachmanides rebuilding his synagogue. It's going to cause an uproar in the Jewish people. It's, they, they tried to stop it, but of course, uh, we still have what we rightfully own. And uh, that was a famous uh, historical part of uh, that land amongst all of the other parts of Israel. It's full of Jewish history full of Jewish history. Every, every few months, they come out with a new coin or a new thing that they found from 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, that has Jewish history in Israel. Um, you can't hide the archaeology that's going on in Israel and what you see that's going on. It's unbelievable. So this is the story of uh, Nachmanides, uh, and we're going we're gonna to look through uh, some of his letter. I'm going to send it out, and I'll read it with you. Maybe you can pass, take, take a bunch and pass. Oh, we'll read it together and then we'll learn some of the things that he told his son because he promised, read this and you're blessed on the day that you read it. And it's true, many people do read this and it's a form of prayer, self-growth, and you're bringing on yourself a lot of good um, when we read this letter. Okay, it's called Igeret Haramban. I actually need one also. <laughs> Take, take a bunch and pass it around to a few people. So that way it goes quick. Okay. You guys ready? You get ready to learn? Something interesting? Okay. Maybe everyone can get the, the letter. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. It's really amazing. We'll see the words and um, we'll talk about some of the ideas in Judaism. It really encompasses all of Judaism in a letter. It's really amazing. You should keep this and whenever you want, study it, read it, and it's good for you. <laughs> Just that you should know, all his students before, if you want to know something really, really interesting... Listen to this. Before he passed away, all his students in Spain told him, before he left to Israel, all his students in Spain said, how would we know, Rabbi, when you pass? You're not going to live forever. How? You're already an old man. You're going to go to Israel. How would we know if you've passed away? So he says, he says to them, if you go to my mother's grave and you'll see that the grave is split, then you know that that's the, the sign that I have passed away. And that's exactly how it was. A few years later, someone was at his mother's grave, noticed the big crack that was happening, and they announced in Spain that Nachmanides, our great leader, has passed, and everyone, the whole Jewish community of Spain was mourning uh, the loss of Nachmanides. We're talking about a huge portion of the Jewish history. In the 13th century, 14th century, Jews were mainly in Spain before the Spanish Inquisition, okay? So there was many, many Jews in Spain. So let's read a little bit about his uh, letter. And it's so beautiful for the Israelis here. It's uh, easy to read in Hebrew, but we'll also learn a little bit on a deeper level. So he actually quotes right when he starts, because he's writing this letter to his son. He, quote, he quotes Proverbs and he says, Listen, my son, to the rebuke of your father. He's writing it and he's giving his son rebuke. And do not forsake the teaching of your mother. You could just imagine, by the way, we're talking the 13th century, no WhatsApp, no phone calls. When you are out and you're traveling, you're out. You really say goodbye. Do you know that in Jewish teaching, if you go away, 
and you come back uh, after 30 days, if you've been traveling and you come back, we say Shekhiyanu when you see, nowadays we don't do that, when you see someone that you've not seen, because it's like, I don't know when I'm going to see you again. People would leave. Uh, the Gaon of Vilna also did that. He left, he wrote a letter to his family, and he didn't know when he's going to see. It's like as if he wrote his will in this letter. So he says to his son, listen to the rebuke of your father, and do not forsake the teachings of your mother. Torat Imecha is the teaching of your mother. Interestingly enough, this is a proverb, so it was written by Solomon, this verse, but he wrote it to his son. And it's interesting to point out that a, the Torah in Jewish teaching, the written Torah, the scroll, that's called rebuke, that's called harsh. When you read it, you're like, whoa. And then the oral Torah, that's like the mother, and that's like the softness of a parent relationship. Every family needs a father and mother relationship involved in their family so that you have the rebuke and you have the softness. A child that grows in a home without a father is, is a lot more challenged. And a child that grows in a home without a mother is very challenged. I know that from people that spoke to me in a, in a home where you have a solid foundation, when you have a loving father who's also very uh, full, full of good rebuke, we're talking about good rebuke that makes sure this child is in a good place. And you have a mother that's full of soothing and love. That is a healthy relationship. That's what's going to build a great child. Okay? In Judaism, we say that you pass your genes to your children and you also pass your behavior genes to your children. What we call epigenetics in uh, modern day uh, science. That we believe behavior is passed on to your child. The... Alta of Slabodka says, a great rabbi says, that of, of the 20th century, he says that if a child, if you see a child in the marketplace and he quickly takes an apple and grabs it and runs home with it, he's not just stealing now. That started with his great, great grandfather and eventually trickled down to the child becoming what he was. How? The great grandfather wasn't a thief. Okay, we're talking about a little kid, but I'm saying the great fat grandfather, he wasn't. A thief, do you know what he did? Maybe he was deceiving his people. Maybe he pretended that he's a, a very important person, deserves a lot of respect. He was pretending he's a very religious man when he wasn't as religious. So he was being a little deceitful. That translated to one generation down, a little more cheating, a little more, a little more, until eventually it becomes that habit of a child. Like we believe that you pass genes to your child, you pass also your behavior to the child. So uh, that's what he's saying to his son. Listen to what I'm telling you. Listen to the behaviors of what we pass to you. Don't lose it, okay? Then he goes on and he says, This is the first midah. This is the first thing he says that a human being, if you want to be good and successful, is this. Always accustom yourself to speak in a soft tone, always. No matter if you're being angered, or people are shouting at you, or if someone's saying free Palestine in your face, or someone, or whatever it is, always win. How do you win? By overcoming your ability to not shout, okay? Your ability to shout means that you are uh, not controlling yourself, but to stay in a calm tone is the start to all good behaviors after. Why does he say that? He says, because if you speak calmly to every person at every time, ah, oh, but this person was screaming at me, free Palestine. This person was, that was my dad and I had to shout back. It doesn't matter. He says, every person at every time. This is something that we must instill in, in ourselves. And he says, why? In doing so, a person is saved from anger. So if you want to know how to save yourself from being angry, what causes someone to being angry? Simple, simple recipe to stopping anger is speaking calmly. When someone speaks calmly, he already has the tools to avoid anger. Where does anger start? You speak loud. You try and overcome everybody else's voice. And then eventually you're like, Rah, and you get angry. Okay? But if you keep on a low tone, the anger can't be expressed. Okay, so that's what he says, that one of the ways to saving yourself from anger is speaking in a soft tone. And he says, he It's a very bad uh, attribute 
Anger is something that you really don't want in you because it causes people to sin. What sin? Where you do much worse than you wanted. When you do things that you really regret. Not only what the Torah says not do, but you do things that deep down you know you don't normally do. That's what anger does. That's why it says in Jewish teaching that anger is like idol worship. Why is it like idol worship? Because you're taking away all of your senses, your intellectual thinking process, and you're literally getting pulled into a different world. You're a different person. You now idolize the situation. Different person. You're not yourself. Just like idol worship, you neglect everything. So to anger leads a person to becoming completely shedded from everything that he is and, and does as a normal uh, person. It says that when you speak pleasantly, just to go back on, on speaking pleasantly, that it avoids you from getting angry, but it also, Our rabbis teach us that when you speak calmly, everything is going to be heard. The words of the wise are heard and listened to when they speak calmly. If you want your children to listen to you, the last thing you want to do is shout to them. You must speak calmly, then they will listen to your words. There's a rejection in our body. As soon as someone shouts, it just, it just goes like that. My heart just closes and doesn't let the words come in. So the way that we allow someone to actually come in to me, into speaking to me, their words actually penetrating and really having an effect on me, is if I am able, as the speaker, to speak in a very soft tone. So... But, uh, uh, Anger is what causes all my problems. It causes me to go way worse than I should have gone. And that brings me to things that I will regret. So let's talk about anger a little bit. Do you know what it says? The Talmud says in Psachim 113b, it says that three things God loves. What are the three things? He says that you're gonna, you're, it's going to resonate. You'll love this. Three things that God loves. What is it? Misha eno koes, someone who doesn't get angry. Someone who doesn't get drunk. I'm sorry. Uh, I took it to myself. Someone who doesn't get drunk. And someone... Umisha eno ma'amid al midotav. Someone who's not strong with all of his uh, behaviors. Meaning, he can forgive. He can forgive sometimes. Not... Oh, you did that to me, I'm going to pay you back. You did that, I'm going to do... You can be forgiving. Someone who's not ma'amid al midotavi, he's able to forgive not a little bit. Stiff. He's not stiffed with his, uh, stiff with, his, uh, with his personality. He can give in a little bit. Sometimes, yes, I can understand this person hurt me, but it's a child. It's, uh, you, know, you can try and resonate and bring good into the situation so you are... Not ma'amid al midotav. You're not just stubborn. Why? Because if you're like that, then that energy comes back to you. Yeah. So those are three things that Hashem, God, really loves. Interesting. Okay. It says, why do we get angry? Why, does, why do people get angry? Huh? Anyone know? Because we're emotional. We're emotional. What's the root of it? Loss of control. Loss of control. What's the root of losing control? I think they, they get triggered. By oh, why are you getting triggered? I'm sorry, I'm the insecurity. You're getting to it. What? That's it. That's it. Trauma. Trauma could be. Trauma could be. So the Ali Shaw says like this. The reason why people get angry is because they have uh, no self-esteem and no true self-worth. True self-worth inside of them. And it makes them need other opinions. Opinions of others. It makes you need the praise of others, which we all do to a certain extent. But you're desperate for it. And then when you don't earn it, you become angry. So there's like a certain sense of ego that's in you that makes you desire the recognition, which is a good thing, but it goes too far and it makes us angry. Okay, so there's a few reasons why we get angry. That's one of them. I want to tell you uh, one or two other things. One of them is because we take on too much. Okay, we take on too much. What does it say in Proverbs? It actually, Tehillim in Psalms, Hashlech al Hashem Yovcha. Throw your weight on Hashem. Stop trying to run the world. You're carrying too much on your back. Take off that backpack and throw it off. What's it like? It's like someone who's on the plane and he says to himself, Listen, I'm on the plane. There's too much weight over here. 
too much, too many bags. So you know what? I'm going to take my bag and I'm going to put it on my back and I'm going to help the plane not have too much weight on the plane. Six months later, what did we find? That there's four still alive and hopefully there'll be many more still alive and we'll bring them home. And it doesn't make a difference where you are politi politically on the spectrum. The fact is that we as Jewish people, we, we do. We do what's right. Now, results, that's up to Hashem. That's always our sign of resilience. That's been our way. We survive a Holocaust. They tell us, you know, people say, oh, Jews are victims. Look at them. They're playing the victim card. We are victims. We'll never forget. But after the Holocaust, four years after the Holocaust, you'll have Jews around the world having a huge impact because they work. They don't stop. We keep going. That is our story. We do our part. We don't let anybody stop us from doing what's required of me, which is living and doing what's right, okay? So that is, um, that is what it is. So sometimes people get angry because they carry too much on them, right? It says, Lo yiten le'olamot le'tzadik. Hashem will never let a righteous person collapse. A righteous person, he throws off what he can't control to Hashem, and the rest is up to Hashem. There's a great rabbi, that his whole life he was very anxious, very religious man. Comes the Holocaust, he's in the, he's in the, in the ghetto, and everything's going crazy. Everyone's chaos, and they see suddenly the rabbis come. They say, "What's going on, Rabbi? You've always been so anxious about doing mitzvot, of making sure that you do the mitzvah right, you do good deeds. You, you're always anxious to do what's right. Why are you calm now?" He says, "Because now it's not in my control. Now." It's, this is what's happening. The, we are being hurt. It's not in our control. I do my part. I'm living. But it's not in my control. So that's why I'm calm. So uh, someone who's able to have calmness is someone that is happy and doesn't get angry. Okay, how do you have that calmness? By uh, being calm. There's a great story that's written in Sefer Hasidim, an old uh, book. Listen to this story. So uh, there was a, a man on his deathbed, and he tells his son, son, whatever you do, if you get angry, before you do anything with your anger, wait one night. If you're angry, okay, that's fine, but wait one night before you do anything. And he listens to his father, he says, okay, that, that was his father's message, that his wish before he passes away. And what happens? Many years later, he has to travel for work, and in those days, there's no, you don't know when you're going to come back, he travels. And he leaves his wife. He says, goodbye, I need to go. We need to make money. We can't survive like this. I will send you. I will go. He travels. And he doesn't know that his wife is pregnant. And he travels far. And for many, many years, he's away. And he's trying to get back. And eventually, he comes back. And he comes back into his house. And he sees, together with his wife, who's now a lot older, a young man. And he gets so upset. He says, how can it be? He takes out a knife. And he's angry, and then he remembers what his father said. If you're angry, wait one night. Calm down and wait one night. He says, I'm going to hold back. He holds back, and he realizes that that young man was his son. So that's the power of anger can hurt who? You more than anybody else, right? Anger, it says when you heat, we spoke about this in the past, when you heat a pot, when you heat food, and it starts overflowing. Have you ever had that? You heat soup or water, it starts overflowing. And it goes everywhere. Where is it most hot? The fire and the pot itself. When it spreads outwards and it goes on the, on the side, it goes on the floor, it's, it's already cooled. It's not as hot. When we are angry, we hurt ourselves way more than anybody else. Who are we hurting? Ourselves, our inner health, our inner body, our, all our, our heart is off our... our it's, it's a known fact that somebody who's able to be calm, that doesn't allow himself to continuously get angry, maybe someone can open the door for them. If somebody doesn't allow himself to continuously get angry, he's going to live longer. Internally, he's healthy. So that's what he says. If you look at his, in the second paragraph, that's what he says. That's what a rabbi say, he says. You see that? In Nadarim 22 in, in number two. Anyone who gets angry... All types of kehenom control over him. As it says, remove anger from your heart 
and take away bad from your flesh. Take the anger from your heart and remove the bad from your flesh. What's the bad from your flesh? Anger. anger is bad for your flesh. Why? Because it destroys your organs. It destroys your inner system. It hurts you more than it hurts anybody else. Welcome, Chaz. You have a chair over there? Good. We've got a chance for chance. Okay. So that's what he says. And, and how do we know bad means Gehenom? It means evil because he says, there's another verse that says bad represents the worst. Okay, in Jewish teaching. Okay. Whoops. I got it. I got it. So another story, a little bit about anger. We, we, we're probably not going to cover the whole thing, but just, just to get the idea of this letter, you can read it to yourself. It's really, really amazing. But another story of anger is it, after World War II, the leading rabbi of America, his name was Rav Moshe Feinstein, who died in 1986. Listen to this. He was born in 95, year 1895, died in 1986. He himself, uh, after the Holocaust, he managed to save work and he saved enough money to buy himself a printed Talmud. And it was a newly printed Talmud, the first Talmud that came after the Holocaust, after World War II. It was called the Scholzinger edition of the Talmud. And he paid so much money to have it printed and he's so excited. And uh, someone came to ask him a question. And as he came to ask him a question, the rabbi left the room a second. And as he left the room, this guy made the ink that was next to his Talmud spill all over his new book that he just paid so much money for. The rabbi came back in. This person was obviously so embarrassed. He comes back in. He smiles. He sits down with his book and he says, my Talmud looks so much more beautiful and moved on as if nothing happened. So that's, uh, that's the beauty of somebody who's able to overcome his anger. It says in Kohelet, in another's teaching, where does anger rest? Here. Anger rests here, not here. It rests right here in your chest. So that's what it says in Kohelet. It says, don't let your spirit get angry quickly. Because where does anger sit? Not in your brain. It sits. It sits on the chest of fools. Why is it the chest of fools? Because you're not using your brain. You're allowing your emotions to come out and not letting your brain... Uh, Control, uh, control you. So uh, there's a great teaching that there's this king that was very, very angry all the time. He, and we're going to talk about that because kings represent someone who's earned a lot, who has wealth, money, deserves rights and privileges and is entitled. Suddenly it gets to your head, right? Someone who's a king and they tell you, you're a king, you're a king, what will happen? It will get to your head. I deserve more and more. So... Huh? You get entitled. So this king was very, very angry, but he didn't like it. So he wrote on this paper three different lines. The first line was, you are a creature, not a creator. You're a creature, not a creator. Number, line number two was, you are flesh and blood, vedam, and eventually you will perish. And number three, he said, there is mercy for you only when you have mercy on others. This was brought by the Me'iri. So a, a great Rishon, a great writer, early writer, also from the times of the Ramban. And he said these words, wow, do you realize that anger can also uh, destroy me and avoid me from having mercy from others as well? Okay, there are so many things. Also, somebody who doesn't know how to deal with challenges is why he gets angry. If you face a challenge, the rabbis say in the Talmud, if you put your hand in the pocket, you get a wrong coin. You put your hand in the pocket, you get the wrong key. And you get, even that has a reason for it. Chal every challenge, don't curse. It has a reason, accept it. It has a reason, it purifies me. It's good, it's good. Say to yourself, it's good, it's good. And it's good, it purifies you, makes you become a better person. Okay? It says in the Midrash, Bamidbar Rabbah, in the Midrash it says, that if someone smashes a bottle of wine in your home, it's happened many times in mine, and you have compassion on them, then God will repay your loss. Whatever you lose, if you have compassion at that moment, you will get so much more from it in the future. Okay, these are 
kind of omens and promises in Judaism based on me overcoming certain behaviors because that's what we are in this world for. Okay, let's continue. So he says in number three that when somebody overcomes anger, what's going to happen to him? When you have freed yourself from anger, the quality of humility will start going into your heart. Now you're not angry. You accept the fact that someone smashed your bottle of wine in front of you and you kept quiet. You accept the fact that somebody's screaming. You don't accept it, but he's screaming in your face, free Palestine. You don't accept it, but you don't, you don't respond back because you know it's not worth it. You're able to overcome all the time your anger. What happens? You're listening to a lot of noise and you're still quiet. You are being humbled. And a humble person is the source of all good. So he says that when someone overcomes his anger and he keeps talking in a soft tone and is able to overcome his anger, he will have a lot of humidity. A lot of humidity. I said humidity by mistake. Right? It will enter your heart, which is the best of all good traits. As it says, the return for humility is Ekev anavayir at Hashem. Because of humility, you will have fear of God. So, do you mind? Does someone mind to open the door? I'm sweating here. So anger leads to, no anger leads to someone who has a lot of humility. Listen to this. In Hebrew, there's a teaching. The word, what's happiness in Hebrew? Simcha. Simcha has in it the root moche. What does moche mean? Yeah, moche. it also means macha. Like memchete, it means to cut out, to wipe out. When someone cleans himself, when someone overcomes, he becomes more humble. He says, okay, it's good, it's good. And he's, he cleans himself from his challenges. He becomes a happy person. An angry person is not a happy person. A humble person becomes a much happier person. And he says, that's uh, one of the teachings uh, that Maimonides says. Maimonides gives a story of a man that was very poor. And he, they asked him, what was you? You're so happy. What was the happiest moment in your life? He said, I was on this ship and I was poor. So I got to sleep together in the bottom of the cabin, like right at the, the worst spot. And there were wealthy people that were in first class or whatever. And they saw me and they threw the trash right next to me and it went all over me. And I was so humiliated. And in that moment, I said, what's the point of getting angry? I didn't even have one bit of anger in me. He said, that was the moment that I felt the most happy. Interesting. You feel humiliated, but it's also the moment that you feel the most greatness. What's water? Water goes from high to low. Where is water the most? In the high places or in the low places? Low. low. Water, right? The ocean is at the bottom. The river goes down, but where does all the water come? At the bottom. Someone who's low can retain much more. Someone who lowers himself. Not lower meaning you reduce completely your self-esteem. You value your self-worth. We'll talk about what the traits of humility. But someone who's able to lower himself, he can, he can have the whole ocean in him. And the water in Judaism is like the Torah, meaning you can contain so much more. You can take so much more. You can deal with so much more. You can do so much more. You, you have so much more ability. That's what humility does. Okay? Also, there's another parable that they say. When do things move the fastest? When does energy move the most? When there's the least resistance. resistance, least friction. Humility is the place where there's no friction. Smooth, like a baby, right? And then you flow a lot of good energy, right? Anyone who's very, very humble becomes very smooth and is able to be able to take so much more and, and, and take in much more wisdom and good and so on. Okay, so humility is the vessel that holds all. So there's a great book called Shevet Musa, and he says like this, what makes a humble person? He says, these are the seven qualities you need. To, how are you going to remember all this? You, these are the, I'll send it to you after. These are the seven qualities you need to be humble. Number one, you speak softly. Because it, it makes you not angry, and then it makes you more humble, speaking softly. Okay, number two, you never allow someone to give you added praise. You allow them to praise you, but never to give you one word of added praise. That's not true. I mean, thank you very much for the compliment, but that's not true. I don't do that. 
Right? So never allow someone to give you added praise. Number three, every time you succeed, you realize and you are grateful for it. Every time you are blessed, you don't say, ah, I deserved it. I earned it. I am now better. I, because what happens is, that's where problems happen. Problems happen in humanity where we become wealthy. And what does it say in Judaism? Kochi ve'otzem yadi asayit achayil The Torah says, eventually, the biggest challenge of, in, on, for mankind is wealth. We say, we have, it's all me. I did all of this. I don't need anybody. I don't need you. I don't need to learn from you. And that's the source of every company being destroyed. Is not willing to learn. Right? Humility is someone that's grateful for every step of his success. Never forget how you became successful and how blessed you are. Yes. Oh, you're just itching your beard? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, another, another thing is makes amends for arguments. Doesn't want to get in an argument. He's the first to step up and say, you know what? I don't want to, I want shalom. I don't want to have this argument. So the first person to jump up to make shalom is someone who's very humble because what happens when you're the first person? Why is that humble? Two people are in an argument. They've been arguing for weeks on end. Who's the humble one? The one that says, I want to make shalom with you. Why? He's lowering, lowering his ego. He knows you hurt my feelings. You were wrong. I am right. That's why I'm angry with you. And I'm right. You were wrong. Why did he do this to me? But you know what? Peace is more important. They say one of the reasons that kids are always happy is because they're more willing to be happy than to be truthful. They're more willing to be happy than the truth. Do you get what that is? He, they know someone hurt them. The kid is upset. He hurt me. Why did he do that to me? And he starts crying straight away. The kid will cry straight away. He hurt me. Why did he do that? That hurts. Five minutes later, the person that hurt him says, it's okay. Let the kid's able to forget straight away. Why? His own happiness is more important than the truth of why did that person hit me? He shouldn't have hit me. The truth is I'm right. I am right. It doesn't matter. I'd rather be happy. That's uh, the Alter Rebbe of Chabad said that. That I'd rather be happy than fight for the fact that I am right. What's more important? Who cares? At the end of the day, if you're humble, you're able to move but on and be happy. Yes? I understand it, but you have life throws at you such difficult situation. How you can like, overcome like, you know, like very tough stuff? You know? There are times when someone throws at you a very rude comment, and you should actually rebuke them. Maimonides says you should forgive. Forgiveness is a virtue of Judaism. It's a good value. But don't forgive if you know that that person needs to be told off. Someone really hit you. You're just going to get, I forgive you, I forgive you. No, 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 no. You don't forgive because you know that there's a, there's a mitzvah in Judaism called that you should rebuke him. If someone hurts you, don't let them take advantage. What you do is you say, that really hurt me. And you make him say, I'm sorry. Not like, say sorry. But just say, you just say that, that really, but that really hurt me. And you know what? When you do that, instead, not fighting, not shouting, you say, that really hurt me. The person in front of you says, you know what? I'm sorry. I didn't realize I, didn't realize I was going to offend you that much. Some, someone did that to me a few months ago. He said something really stupid. And I said, you know, that, that really said, that embarrassed me. And he said, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize it. And, uh, you know, OK. Hopefully, he never does it again. So. Uh, there's so many stories of humility. In the, in the 19th century, there was two great rabbis of halachic authority. One was called Rabbi Kiva Eger in, in Poland, and the other one was called Rabbi Yaakov Lobebom. In this, he wrote the book, The Nasivas. And he, the two great, great rabbis of the 19th century, they were traveling to Warsaw. They were traveling to Warsaw, and uh, as they were coming into the city in the carriage, Tens of thousands of people were coming to see them. Everyone was coming to see the great two rabbis. Now, as they're arriving, they see hundreds of people, thousands of people. They, each rabbi is sitting in his own side of the carriage, in his own book, studying. And they said, there's so many people here coming to visit. For sure, they're coming to visit that rabbi.
And the other rabbi said, for sure he's coming to visit this rabbi. So they said, well, I'm not going to stay in this carriage. They both ran out the carriage and went into the crowds of the people, both thinking that the, everyone's there to respect the other rabbi. Eventually, everyone was running to the carriage, but there was no one in it. It was already empty. Both rabbis ex- uh, uh, left the carriage thinking it's not worthy of me that they should all praise me. So that's the value of humility. Okay. So he says that with humility, you get the fear of Hashem. What does, what does it mean to have the fear of God? Does anyone know? Um, I know what does it mean, Yirat Hashem? So the word is actually Yirah. Yirah is different than Pachad. It's not... Yir'ah comes from the word awe. Listen to what Maimonides says. People don't know this. People don't know this idea about Judaism. I'm going to finish because I'm so hot. But people do say this idea about Judaism. They say, this is Maimonides in Yisodeh HaTorah. He says, where's the mitzvah to love Hashem? Where does it say that we should love God? In which part of Judaism? Does anyone know? I don't think it says uh... Yes, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, and then we say, Ve'ahavta et Hashem Elokecha. You should love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your money. And then there's another pl- verse which says, Et Hashem Elokecha Tira. Hashem, you should fear. What does it mean to love and fear God? Maimonides says like this: Walk around this world, and you say, Wow, look how beautiful the world is. Look how much is done. I know that there's problems, but look how much is done for me to exist. The air, my heart is pumping a hundred thousand times. The fact that I have a job, every person here has some form of money. The fact that I'm able to eat, all of the positives, and there are thousands of things. Your, part, your heart pumps a hundred thousand times a day. Your brain has hundreds of thousands, millions of synaptic connections, and they are functioning without you even thinking about it. Do you understand how much is happening in your day-to-day life? You, you're complaining about the traffic. You have a car that takes you in the traffic. It's pretty wild. You're complaining about the fact that you have bills. You have a house for which to have bills. You're complaining about the fact that you have uh, people that aren't listening to you. you. Well, thank God you have money to employ them. And so on and so forth. Whatever situation you're in, you can find love by contemplating all the good that happened to you till this moment. And when someone does that, realizes how vast the world is, how great the world, how much love there is in the world. If there's a creator, look how much love there is in the world. You will also be filled with awe and respect. What does humility lead someone to have? A lot of respect, a lot of gratitude, and a lot of awe. That's what Yirat Hashem means. Yirat Hashem, fear of God, is not that I'm scared that something like a lightning bolt is going to hit me. It's actually the opposite. It's because I see so much good in the world, I'm at all at the greatness of this world. Wow. How can I ever do something wrong to the creator of the universe? If I was created every second I'm alive, my heart is pumping. That's a gift. With all my gifts. By the way, you know, there's a commandment in Judaism to, to say you're sorry. It's actually to do teshuvah. Vit vado. People should confess. Whenever you do something wrong, it's good to go in a quiet place and say, I know. Say it out. I know I did something wrong. I'm sorry for what I did. I know that I did something wrong. Say that to yourself. In a closed room, it doesn't need to be with anybody else. That's a mitzvah in Judaism. One of the 613 commandments. My Maimonides says that's a commandment. Where's that commandment written? By theft. If you steal from someone, you give back the money, but you still, according to Jewish teaching, need to speak it out to God and say, I'm sorry. We do that in Yom Kippur. We say, I'm sorry, Ashamnu, Baganu, Gazalnu, we stole. And there it says, by theft, it says the idea that we should say we're sorry and confess. Why by theft? Because every single thing we do wrong, we're stealing. In a way, we're stealing. You got, you got, every time you do something wrong, not just stealing, every time we do something wrong, we have a heart that's pumping. Who's making my heart pump? My Brain is thinking. Who's making my brain work? My mouth is able to talk. I have energy in my body that's being processed. Who's giving me all this energy? Yes, it's true. I put my food in my mouth. But do you know how many bacteria is in that food? Who's fighting all that bacteria, making sure it doesn't destroy me? So in Jewish teaching, every second you're alive, 
you are being filled with tremendous amount of love, tremendous amount of energy. And when we do what's wrong, we're using all that energy and stealing it for a bad thing that we shouldn't do. So that's why, it's, that's why confession or, or saying that I'm wrong is in the place of theft. Because we're also, whenever we do anything wrong, it's a form of stealing. It's not completely stealing, there's a form of stealing. Anyway, so Maimonides says that that's how somebody has a tremendous strength is through humility. I want to finish off with humility, some ideas about humility and how that causes somebody to have tremendous amounts of fear of God and be a good person. The famous Rothschild family, have you heard of them? Yeah. The famous Rothschild Bank, they were the Jewish family that were major philanthropists in Germany. They invented banking. Yes. Listen to this, they found the family they noticed that one of the family, there were many family members of the Rothschild family, one of them, every day in the afternoon at 12 o'clock, he left the bank and he went somewhere. And one of his followers, one of his workers said, I want to follow him. Where is he going every day at noon? For an hour, he goes and comes back. He wants to follow him, he follows him. And he saw that he went to the graveyard. He takes off the clothes that he's wearing and he puts on his cheap clothes that he had when he was when he didn't have as much money. He takes off his clothes, he puts on these cheap clothes, and he goes to the grave of some of his family members and he starts crying. Every day he did that. That every day he said, I don't want this money to get to my head. I want to stay humble. And that's how they became such great philanthropists. Yes, they did have a huge influence and make a lot of money, but they also became great philanthropists. Philanthropist is a sign, philanthropy is a sign that a person is also humble with his success, okay? Uh, according to Judaism, uh, it says that a person in the Talmud, it says like this, this is interesting. It says that a person is like the king. When you come in this world, it's like a king that gives his garments to you. So imagine a king. He has two people in front of him, two of his country, Two people of his country, he decides to give them his royal clothing. And he says, for one month, I want you to wear my royal clothing. I love you guys so much. Wear my royal clothing. And one of them, two different people, one of them was smart. He takes the clothing and he looks after it. He wears it. Doesn't make it dirty. And not only does it, when he returns it after a month, he returns it clean. He returns it cleaner than it was when he got it. He even fixed it up a little bit. And the other guy takes the clothing and makes it dirty and says, ah, the king's got money, he has workers, eh. And takes the royal garb and puts it in a bag and says, here, after a month, here's the garb after a month. He gives it back to the king. The king sees a dirty clothing. That's how it is with our soul also. Our goal in this world is to go in it and we have given this clothing. What is it? The soul in the body. We're given a gift, which is free will. We have the choice. And we have to return that soul more clean than it was when we got it. Okay, that's the garment that we're meant to return when we leave this world. Okay, there are many, many other things here. But, uh, and how awe is connected to humility. But I think I'm going to stop it here because uh, it's a little late. And I hope you guys enjoyed. And maybe next week we'll continue a little more. Thank you. Thank you.